Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. I want to call this State Board of Education Academic Standards and Assessment Committee meeting to order. It is 9.35 a.m. Monday, September 14, 2020. Are we, um, do we want to do introductions this morning? Are there new people on, on, the, on the screen, Ajit? Uh, I think we can do introductions as the topics come up. Got it, good, good. Um, first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from our June 22nd, 2020 meeting. Is there a motion? So moved, Martha. Estela, second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thumbs up. All right. Any opposed? Any changes? That is. All right, motion carries. Um, we'll go on to the African American, Black, and Puerto Rican Latino course of studies. I believe, Irene, that is you, correct? Yes, you good morning. Thank you. Thank good you morning. so much. We are here this morning to provide you an update on the African American, Black, Puerto Rican, Latino course of study, the curriculum that we've been working on. And with us, we have a number of partners. Um, as you know, like you, this is a project that we're incredibly proud of to be a part of and passionate about. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleagues at the agency. We have uh, Dr. Melissa Hickey, our Director of Reading and Literacy and Director of Perkins, and she's been um, championing this work um, from the very beginning. Also with us is Dr. Gladys Lavis, our Director of Languages and Equity, and she will also be presenting with us, and Stephen Armstrong, our Education Consultant for K-12 Social Studies. So at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Gladys Lavis, who will introduce our partners from CERC. Thank you, Irene. Um, and um, it's true, this is groundbreaking. This is such an exciting uh, curriculum to be part of. And um, and of course, this curriculum has has been always been data driven and also has stakeholders feedback. And we're still looking for more feedback. And we hope that in this meeting and in future meetings, we could continue to make this curriculum more viable for our students in Connecticut. At this time, I'd like to introduce Michelle LeBron Griffin um, and Paquita Jamar Smith and Nitsa Diaz, who will be presenting for CERC, and we have been working very closely with them on this uh, project. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Gladys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're honored to be at this stage. I'm just going to share my screen. Everyone see that okay? Um, we are honored to um, and excited to be at this stage in presenting um, the work over the past year um, plus to you. We're going to start with just a little history of the legislation and the vision. Um, as you may or may not know, it actually sat as two separate bills that came forward and then were integrated and combined into the African American, Black and Puerto Rican Latino studies. It was passed in June of 2019 and CERC was actually written into the legislation under section three as the coordinating entity for the curriculum development. This will actually be uh, the first integrated model statewide curriculum in our state. There is no precedence for a model statewide curriculum, um, not even in the area of literacy. So we will be working with all 169 school districts, 206 plus high schools, including um, obviously our private schools, our regional schools, our alternative high schools, our unified juvenile justice high schools to support the implementation of this elective full course. Um, that will run uh, a full course year for a single credit, even though it will have what we're calling a semester by semester focus. Semester one being African and American and Black histories and semester two being Puerto Rican Latino histories. There's approximately 10 units of study, which I'll go over in a moment in regards to how we went about that. But just to assure you that we have very much closely aligned with our Connecticut social studies framework which is written into the legislation. 
but also um, obviously in the social studies framework, it speaks to an inquiry-based approach. So it is not only important that we're developing students' content and cultural knowledge, but we're also supporting them in their identity development and that social construction of who they are, who they've been told they are, um, as American citizens. And so it is hoped and it's desired and part of the vision of this is that we're not only supporting students in learning our, more about our collective history, but we're also supporting them in their civic mindedness, um, in some of the uh, requirements if you think about the vision and portrait of a graduate for 2023 and hopefully um, interest in pursuing some future ethnic studies again not only at the high school level but potentially at the college level in the legislation it is written that high schools may offer in the 21-22 school year which is thus the push of why we are um, engaging in conversations with you so we can get information out to districts who will be building obviously approvals for this course to go into the program of studies as early as this coming january there is a must that all high schools be online by the 22-23 school year, but we will be using that initial year for those who are interested to participate in a field study, which we will talk about in a moment. So what that will entail for those that do sign on in that initial year is there will be uh, support, obviously, through the State Department with administrators and counselors to ensure that students are aware, to ensure that infrastructures are in place uh, so that we can actually have students seated and registered for these selected courses. Um, the initial implementers will engage in um, what is suggested to be professional development starting as early as next spring, going into the summer, and then ultimately throughout the subsequent year through curriculum council meetings, but also through coaching sessions. There's also a vision um, recognizing that we have um, a lot of teachers who this will be new information. Um, in some of the research, we found that there are currently 16 high schools that have some type of Africana studies or Latino studies being implemented currently. Um, and recognizing that about 96% of our teaching force is white. A lot of concern was raised in regards to the swift need to not only build the content knowledge, but also to build the disposition to be engaging in the dialogues and conversations in the classrooms that will occur through a course like this. Um, these will be taught by certified social studies teachers. It will come through, um, obviously, history or social studies departments. Um, but we wanted to um, offer, obviously, as much support through the professional development as possible. So creative ideas came through um, the work of all of the committee members. <clears throat> in regards to what we can offer in, in relation to a speakers bureau, where we could actually use some of the um, blessings of our COVID restrictions. Uh, you know, Ajit was commenting in regards to, we've all become so fluent with the technologies now in remote learning. So how do we bring um, districts together, right? So districts who may be more diverse, districts who may be less diverse, districts who may be more, you know, uh, isolated because of, you know, again, of our pandemic restrictions. And so using those to bring speakers to the table who may be historians, who may be um, able to provide some of those very personalized oral histories. And so we're very excited about the build of that. And then also um, piggybacking on what the State Department is building in regards to their curriculum tools online, um, advancing some of the lesson repositories, which we will also talk about in a moment. The process itself consisted of an 150 advisory group. Uh, that is actually unheard of when you think about advisory groups. There's typically 25 to 30 people, um, stakeholders. We had so many stakeholders and true to SERP's um, values and beliefs is we wanted to be all inclusive and not um, you know, shortchange or miss anyone. Um, and so we um, included everyone, right? Of those 150, there's about 60 to 70 um, who are doing the lion's share of the work that advisory group comes together a total of six times, um, although that may continue obviously depending on um, you know, the future direction of the curriculum implementation. The committees themselves, uh, there were nine in total. We began with research and evaluation. So you heard me speaking of, we found out what high schools were currently doing and actually asked them to submit their syllabi, to submit their curriculum, to submit their types of assessments so that we had some things to work with. We also conducted a high school curriculum survey where we um, 
learned in regards to who is ready, who is not ready, who um, is excited, what's their potential for. And we actually learned over 60% of the high schools are eager and ready to get started in that 21-22 school year. We also researched what is actually happening in our nation, what type of curricula other states have in place. And so we found several other states who do have Africana studies or Latino studies, again, fewer with Latino studies, but none in our nation who have an integrated model, Connecticut being the first. And so that was another um, a thing that was very um, exciting to hear on behalf of our legislators, uh, that, that research that was conducted. We then moved into our focus groups in March, of which um, we were only able to host one uh, live. They were meant to be uh, regionally throughout the state. We held one at Torrington High School on March 3rd, and then we went into our COVID restrictions. So the remaining focus groups had to be um, restructured in, into a virtual format. Uh, we held 12 fo focus groups online in total, which were for students, but also for educators and families throughout um, March and into April. And that information uh, and themes that we learn from there will obviously be included in our um, deliverables that are submitted to you, which we will talk about a little bit further. But some of the themes from that are things like students wanting to hear more than about their oppressions and victimization and wanting to hear about the contribution of their cultures to our country wanting to um, engage in conversations and dialogues in the classrooms that they've not been able to have before and having teachers prepared and ready to engage um, in that conversation um, it was very important about the historical accuracy, um, the historians and community members who participated, and very important that about teacher preparedness um, to engage as well as school and community preparedness so that this wasn't just an elective that sat in and of itself, but the climate and culture that was established within the school building was very important um, to our focus group participants. We then led into conversations in regards to infrastructure supports. Um, again, recognizing that we um, have a lot of district decisions that are, are, are made within our state, um, but there are some guidelines, if, if you may, uh, recommendations that are being suggested. So there's more uniformity than difference in regards to the implementation. The core syllabus committee then established the framework in regards to the learning objectives and essential questions that would be utilized to align across the units and then obviously the bulk and lion's share of the work has been conducted by our two content development committees for african-american black and puerto rican latino they have developed the units of study which we'll go over in a moment um, then right now what we're in the midst of is the integration and assessment so we've taken um, our review cycle by not only our advisor group members but also the expert review panel of which we um, out reached out to um, some national experts as well as some local um, people that include superintendent levels um, national experts such as folks like Dr. Silvestrini, such as um, Dr. Paul Ortiz, and others who gave us um, some exceptional feedback in regards to the potential for this curriculum to be a national model. Their feedback is allowing us to enhance and refine. Um, they are actually filled with not only uh, knowledge and experience themselves, um, but resources. So they really were extending their hand in providing us a lot of different materials um, and certainly a lot of electronic digital type things um, that we were able to supplement into the various units. And so that's where we're, we're at right now. Um, we also had a publications and dissemination committee who was working closely with Doug Casey um, and not only how this sits obviously on the State Department website, but how we actually um, get this to be something that is robust and revolving and contributed to it over time as we engage and embark on that initial year of implementation. And then as you um, continually heard me say is that there has been a lot of desire to talk about what supports will be in place for the teachers and so a recommended professional learning plan will also be part of the deliverables that are submitted. So all of this will come to you um, on October 16th so that you have a month to review prior to your November 16th meeting of which I believe Ajit we've been invited back to kind of
collaborative workshop with you throughout that meeting to discuss, receive feedback, to think about what components will go forward for approval to the State Board of Ed, what components are still works in progress. We will submit to the State Board of Ed on November 18th, which is two weeks prior to their December 2nd meeting. The December 2nd meeting will be the full presentation hopefully from this committee and representatives of also CERC State Department and our advisor group representatives, um, and then any outcomes of that for final revision by December 18th. So we have this all wrapped up with a red ribbon um, by the January timeline. Um, Dr. Hickey and Dr. Labas have been very um, kind in saying this is a great plan. It may not all go as cleanly as we have just outlined, but this is um, what, what we are working towards. So what you can expect in regards to what you will receive on October 16th is what you see presented on this slide. There will be a preface that has a history of the legislation, the curriculum development process that I just outlined for you, obviously in narrative format, the course description and pedagogy, which we are working closely with the State Department to fine tune, the curriculum framework, the units of study, there'll be some sample lessons that will be examples of what we'd like to see in the future repository, and then an appendix that includes everyone who was involved, um, the recommended document for district guidance, the professional learning plan, um, the complete learning lizard letter for the court. So the UBD template, um, just to uh, bring us there for a moment. And as you, in order for everyone to see that, I have to stop this share, is that correct? If I brought up another screen, Ajit, do I stop this share and then start a new share? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, okay, let me try that. That's a clean way to do it. Okay, I'll try that. Michelle? Michelle? I mean, yes, sir. Yeah, um, you can call me, please. Um, can I ask any committee members if they have questions thus far? Because you gave a lot. And, so, and, and I wanted to see if, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, if anyone had any questions uh, to this point. I have a lot of questions. Uh, yes, sir. And as I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, my understanding is we're the you're going to present again in this committee October 16. That's the next meeting of the committee. I don't believe that's the next meeting. I'm not sure. Ajit can help with that. October 16th, we're just submitting materials to you for review. I don't believe we're coming back to sit with you again until your November 16th meeting. Okay. I don't November know 16th. when you're meeting in I don't oh, know when okay. you're meeting in October well, is. What I, what I wanted to know was the date. You know, when will we receive it again? In, uh, On October you know. 16th. Okay, you you mail it, but we're going to discuss it on November 16th. Okay, that's yes, that was yes. the the first question. the The second question is, my understanding is, you know, the the process is very um, impressive. You've had a very thorough um, a, a process that includes a lot of feedback and, and inclusion and and whatever. I would be interested in seeing especially for the Latino curriculum, the national experts that um, you said you consulted. I know Blanca Silvestrini, so if you consulted with her, you know, that would, that would, that would sort of validate um, more for me uh, the substance of the curriculum, so, and whoever else you consulted with, so that would be important for me. My understanding also is that you, there was limited funding allocated or no funding allocated for this project, is that true? That's correct. Um, 400,000 total um, for the curriculum development, 100,000 stayed with the State Department, and 300,000 came to CERC. Okay. And then that is, the that is that is all there is. Um, that does not entail any of the professional development. It's just the curriculum development. And so what we are working with the legislators now, um, so as um, 
Dr. Labus has suggested is we've been keeping very close uh, communication with them in regards to our progress. We just met with them maybe a week and a half ago to mention that, okay, it's now time to start thinking about implementation dollars. And so that is something we're actually getting them a draft um, estimated cost for what the uh, supports for professional development and in those initial two years of implementation will look like. Okay, thank you. I, I do understand, and you know, I'm, I, I'm going to apologize beforehand, but I had a very rough start of in the morning. My, my husband had a doctor's appointment at eight o'clock, and when oh, we got there, no, when we got there, it had, camp, had been canceled. So we got up very early. Oh, so okay. I started screaming and, and yelling. So I'm not still in my best, um, a, you know, a, a sense of humor, but Ajit is laughing, but. I would appreciate, you know, even though you're going to send the final thing, I would have appreciated for this meeting having a sense of the curriculum. You know, I understand the process. I understand all that. But I would have appreciated having a draft of something that allows me to really understand what you're doing and where you are. It sounds very exciting. But to me, it's all, it's all um, you know, um, a, hypothetical because I'm not seeing anything. So that's yes, so, I, so I have a couple more. I have a couple more slides. Not to interrupt you, um, Ms. Lopez, but, but Eric said to pause here. So the subsequent slides is you're going to see a little more about the content now. Okay. So if you, that's just Melissa, a little bit more in the presentation. I because I work with Melissa a great deal. That you know, having that draft really helps me um, to to provide feedback mm -hmm. and to sort of you know, uh, help you also understand where the board is coming from. So when you present to the board, when we present to the board, the committee is really supportive of what is being presented. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Estella. I have, I have one, Michelle, and just a clarification. You mentioned that 96% teachers are white. Is that the full aggregate population of teachers in Connecticut or percentage of teachers who are teaching this curriculum? Oh, that's a great comment. Um, that is total population in the state of Connecticut. Um, what we don't know yet is who have been selected to be teaching this course, but we will know that within the next six months. So that information we could actually absolutely circle back with you on. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Please carry on. Okay. I, have a I have a question. Okay, well, I'm sorry. By the way, good morning, Michelle, and everyone. Um, good morning. Michelle, my question is, um, in terms of the curriculum and the at the end of the of the school year, the academic year, because I know you're, you mentioned that you want to start this in January, right, of 2021. Is that correct? Well, it will start in September of 21, so the coming school year, but the okay. January piece is so that what we're trying to do now is to um, support schools who want or desire to register students to have the course listed in their program of studies. We're, we're trying to get them what they need by January because that's typically when program of studies are um, published um, online for students to make their selections. And so that's why this timing is so important. So the districts who do want to implement for the 21 to 22 school year, September to June, have that listed as a course in the program of studies this January. Okay, which takes me into the most important question in my opinion. So how are you gonna know mm -hmm. that this program has been effective and successful? I mean, what kinds I'm so of- so excited that you asked. Yes. Right. So, so that's something that's actually um, the monitoring component is actually listed in the legislation as a responsibility of the State Department of Education. But as Dr. Labus has suggested, we are working um, very closely with them and there are plans for that initial year of implementation to be a field study. So that during that whole time we are, um, so as you can, you know, just kind of foreshadowing, if you can imagine we're teaching content units one, two and three which will bring teachers september to november let's say and then 
we, we can hear Michelle. And they're in implementing we have a feedback loop we come back engage together you know by curriculum meetings and then we teach them lessons that are being developed um, and, and feedback being provided and then uploaded to a repository for other teachers to benefit from so by that second year you actually have a research evolved curriculum that is field you know tested that includes um, one thing that we're hearing is can you really do all of what you are suggesting within a single course, right? And so we're doing some shaving right now in regards to the content so that we do not uh, shortchange the uh, student discussions and inquiry that are going to be the hub of this course, right? And so that's where we're really fine tuning some things. And there has even been a suggestion that maybe there is an advanced level course as a part two that this feeds into. Again, horizon, vision, right? No mm -hmm. set in stone, but but exactly mm -hmm. as you're suggesting, the field study will illuminate um, those types of realities for us. So great question, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the feedback, yes. And, and 20, I'm sorry, in 2021 or, or September 21 is a May offer, not a must offer. 22, 23 is the must, right? Yes, okay. sir. And Thanks. so we are going to work with Steve Armstrong, you know, over the next month or so to see what districts are interested in that initial implementation year. We'll be able to get to you, um, Mr. Clemens or Dr. Clemens, I'm sorry, I don't know, um, but we'll be able to get Eric? information to, okay. <laughs> we'll be able to get information to you in regards to who those implementers are. So I will go to um, the screen share again. This time I wanna share with you the units of study. Okay, so hopefully you all can see that okay. Um, so this, is, this is what you will see, yeah. right? It's very hard to see. Yeah, yeah make I'm it a little struggling. bit larger. Okay. Let me make it larger, okay, better? Uh, is that uh, it's not better for me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, for those obviously being an, a standards and assessment committee, you are familiar with understanding by design framework. And so, that is the framework we used with a little bit of some um, expansions, obviously, for our purposes. So, there's three phases or three steps to UBD. Obviously, the desired results are the beginning. And so you will see relevant content standards and supporting standards listed there. Um, but then it moves into <clears throat> the learning outcomes and the critical consciousness. And so this is where you will see learning objectives from um, obviously our, our core syllabus, but you will also see unit specific undering understandings as well as unit specific increase. Step two or part two of UBD is how the learning will be evidenced. So how you will prove obviously that students are um, understanding and acquiring the skills. So there'll be pre-assessment that will include some of the common misconceptions about the content of the unit, combination of formative um, and summative assessments that will look more um, like project-based inquiries or performance tasks. And then you will see a variety of lessons. Um, we're not actually, you know, preparing lessons themselves. Teachers will still obviously have that discretion, but we are giving them the big ideas and topics to be addressed. We are giving them the recommended learning activities, which includes the UDL or universal design approaches for a variety of learners. And we've also included asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities here. We've also talked a lot about the options for interdisciplinary integration. So what can we be talking about in our English classes? What can we be doing in our art classes? What can we be doing in our other history courses that can support the conversations of this particular course? There's a huge, as I mentioned, um, material resource bank speaker bank. Um, we've also include what we're calling home links here to support not only our youth and, and our families at home in understanding the new information um, that may be being provided to them, how to um, include some of their own histories from their 
um, communities or from their own family heritage to actually inform their participation in the course. So those home links are very important and is that that's actually something that we took from Second Steps curriculum as a successful practice um, out of SEL work. And then finally, the extensions and experiential opportunities. So again, recognizing that our classroom should not be um, limiting, but we could have um, field opportunities where students are going out to Amistad or Wadsworth or local community uh, historical societies or um, you know, virtual field trips um, if necessary, again, um, given our pandemic restrictions. But those are all opportunities that we want to be certain are, are beyond the boundaries or walls of the classroom. So the lessons will obviously be, be in some semblance of a scope and sequence according to essential understandings moving into obviously analysis and then ultimately applications. And so each of, of the lessons um, are sequenced that way, but certainly if a teacher needs to move, you know, lesson three to lesson two because of conversation and dialogue that's occurred, he or she will have that discretion. So some of the topics, um, and this is where again, I have to come out for one moment. So if you'll bear with me. Okay, so hopefully you can see this slide here. Some of the um, topics of the various units, as you heard me mention earlier, semester one, semester two, um, and this is where I'm actually going to ask my colleagues, Paquita Jarman-Smith and Nisa Diaz to chime in. So Paquita, if you can go ahead first and outline units one through five. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so grateful and excited to share with you some of the work that the committee has been doing on the units of study for African American and Black history. It will start with, um, in addition to looking at the African origins of humanity and the dispersal of uh, peoples about uh, throughout the globe, we will also um, give students um, an opportunity to build a classroom culture where they can have um, conversations, honest conversations, safe conversations about things that are difficult to talk about. So talking about race, talking about um, norms for discord, respectfulness, and then African origins, really setting the stage to see the strengths of Africans, the contributions and the lives that um, have been lived by Africans prior to coming to the United States. Unit two, um, and it's all, it's in a historical sequence. So then we'll move, um, oh, excuse me, going back to unit one, there is also a unit where students will hear stories of resistance that pertain to slavery. Um, so some of the, the um, people here in Connecticut and some of their efforts in order to become free will be highlighted. So we have historians that have the actual histories of our own people here that will be highlighted. Unit two is about Black literacy organizations and liberations. So this period of time is talking about um, the work toward abolition, the work toward freedom, all of the organizations that supported African Americans in becoming liberated and their, um, their challenges as well. Unit th three moves on in history where we're looking at um, after um, abolition and emancipation, that history for equality, looking at Jim Crow systems, also looking at some of the um, key people who fought for freedom and justice. Moving on to Black movement for equality, again, we can see some of the, the, the struggles and some of the accomplishments of Blacks and African Americans over time. And then finally, Unit 5 will be talking about more of the presence from the 1950s all the way up to the present. 
So students will have a look at um, accomplishments, leadership, uh, organizations uh, such as Black Panthers, um, the student youth movement, um, popular um, culture such as hip hop, um, the arts, um, all the way through to our present times, which is, which is exciting because history is being made today. So what does protest and politics look like in the past as well as in our present and in our future? Throughout um, the units of study, we have themes of resistance, advocacy. Um, uh, it's just so much, so much richness that you're going to see in this curriculum. They're integrating intersectionality of, of women, of, of um, different fields of study, inventors, artists, so many great things. That's it for me. Thank you, Paquita. Uh, Nita, you want to go ahead with semester two? Hi, good morning. So I just wanted to give you a little statistic just because we are on Latino Heritage Month. And as you know, 25% of our students in our state are Latino. And that means I want you to think about, like someone said once, what would that look like in 10 years from now if 25% of our students are Latino? So we are very excited to have these Puerto Rican and Latino units. So we started with early beginnings and what students are going to look like at that there is about indigenous cultures, about Tainos and Arawas and Aztecs, right? And also who are Latinos as it relates to a racial group? Who are Latinos and Puerto Ricans as it relates to, what does that look like in the USA and also in Latin America and the Caribbean? And what does that look like? And so then the unit two, they're going to move to what we call blood. And blood is about understanding what happened when Columbus arrived to the Americas. What, uh, what was that encounter with indigenous? They are going to look at that perspective from the, uh, what we call the voices that are not heard, right? That behind and underneath the story. So they're going to see some writings, for example, from Bartolome de las Casas, who talks about who wrote about the indigenous treatment and who they were, but highlighting the aspects what we have been uh, mandated, for lack of a better word, by the students to do. Highlight the positive, teach us what empower us. So that is how we're looking at this curriculum based on that, from their voice, right? And in blood, we do uh, talk about what the, uh, early beginnings were as it relates to what happened in Latin America and the Caribbean when the colonizers arrived. When colonizers arrived, we moved to unit three, which is sweat, which is understanding what colonialism looked like in Latin America. And then how does that kind of um, change and also brought slavery into the Americas at that time? And so I'm not, I don't think that's me. So how do we now help our students understand colonialism in Puerto Rico, as well as in other countries in Latin America? Latin America and the Caribbean, as you know, is huge. And we were mandated on our side by legislators to, to talk about Puerto Rico and other countries and other Latino groups. So what we decided to also is to give them a sample of certain Latino groups based on our student population. Truly, we looked at some of that stuff and give the students the opportunity to do a lot of project-based learning. If they choose, if they are a student who, uh, whose family migrated from Ecuador and that's what they want to study in their project base in unit three or unit two, they, they will have that opportunity to do that. So we look at colonialism, we look at uh, the sweat, meaning the workforce that came in and what the impact that had when we started to do the defiance, which is about Latino civil rights movement, which is about using art and music as a form of protest. So despite, you know, one of our committee members said, despite that you tried to change us, we ended up changing you. This is why our unit is about defiance. And, and it's that understanding that our students are going to get of this is how we use art, this is how we use music, this is how we use and understand colonialism in a way that is going to help you see 
who we are, right, as, as Latinos. And then we end up with contributions of Puerto Ricans and Latinos in Connecticut. We wanted them to know about who your, are, your heroes are in the state and what contributions they have in Connecticut and uh, <clears throat> around their state, right? So for example, we have a lesson on Borinqueneers, which is a military and that uh, the people who were in Connecticut, and we do have in our speaker bureau that Michelle was talking about, we have been collecting names that we are going to hopefully have them talk to our students about what does it mean to be a Latino in Connecticut? What does it mean to be a Puerto Rican in Connecticut? And how does that empower our students to be proud of who they are? And that is basically it. so much needs uh, and Paquita as well. Um, so Ms. Lopez, we will uh, give you slides that support the narrative that Paquita and Nita just described for your future reference. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll be sure to incorporate the slide with the 10 um, expert review panel members as well. So at this point, we will take any other questions um, of the uh, committee, but we also have two uh, lingering questions for you. In regards to our preparation for the October submission, what criteria will the committee be using for the curriculum review? Do you have a particular rubric? Are there particular areas or components that you're more um, or less interested in? And is there specific information you are seeking or in need of um, from us in the meantime that maybe was not mentioned here? Mm -hmm. I, I think, if I may, Eric, if I may address, um, I, I don't think as a board we make curriculum, you know, honestly. I think we accept your curriculum recommendations, but there are a number of things that we are going to be ensuring that are included. I will ask questions. What is the assessment process? How this is going to be evaluated? Mm -hmm. uh, and a, it's an important component. What, you know, the professional development areas questions is most of the teachers are not teachers of color. We want to make sure that whoever teaches the course mm -hmm. has the knowledge and expertise and has been um, given the tools to do it well. Also, you know, again, my question regarding who were the experts that were consulted. There are many ways of addressing um, the themes that are presented. So what I want to make sure is that um, uh, the choosing the curriculum uh, was done with solid expertise. And as you have described, the process included a lot of feedback. So I think those things are the ones that I care about. And I think, I don't think we should be as a board looking at, you know, what are the objective, what are the, you know, uh, the, the, the minutia of the uh, lesson plan itself, but the overall uh, um, uh, indicators that ensure that a curriculum is solid and can be implemented well. And then uh, all, all also, you know, um, you want to make sure that the curriculum is live. So it doesn't mean that once we approve it, it's set in stone that there will be an opportunity for revisions and feedback and improvement. That's sort of my perspective regarding our role uh, and what we should ensure that happens when we discuss it. Can I also add to that? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, just, I cannot I speak just, for the rest of my colleagues. Can I reply to one thing Ms. Lopez mentioned? Um, Ajit and I have been chatting um, in the chat <laughs> um, about the percentage that I quoted in regards to our teacher force and the current 1920 percentage um, that has been updated is 90.4 of our educators are white. So uh, that's just an update because I, I shared 96%. So it's actually 90.4. Um, so yes, Ms. Lopez, we are excited about um, and, and very much in tune with everything you mentioned in regards to our role and the evolution of the curriculum. Thank you. Can I, can I also enhance what uh, Dr. Lopez has shared with all of us? Um, I'm, I'm visioning this also as where students, Generation Z students, they want to be engaged. 
right? So we want to look at what kinds of materials you're using. Uh, lesson, I, I know you, you met, uh, you're you going to break it down and we're going to be able to see uh, uh, simplified things for us like Estella's asking for so that we understand what the curriculum is going to look like in the classroom. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't see when, um, when we were talking about both African American and the Puerto Rican Latino studies, I didn't see the, the celebration of, 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 of events, of cultural events in the curriculum. If, and you can correct me, Michelle. Like, for example, um, I, I'm at Central and we have the, the Caribbean Center and the African American Center, and we work together in collaboration to bring mm -hmm. days of culture you know, Dia de los Muertos or, or Los Tres Reyes Magos, or we do Martha Luther King, right, on campus. And we bring we bring the students together. So there's a sense of, of community, okay? It goes back to some of the, the lesson plans that you have there. So um, so I'm hoping to see that, there, that you do have a month of Heritage Month where students are the ones putting the projects together, okay? so that they take ownership of the curriculum and, and the lesson plans and whatever happens inside and outside of the classroom. Yeah. Okay, so the, yeah, there be yes. In terms of having celebrations or even having um, mm -hmm. like exhibits and um, things for the mm -hmm. whole school to see where they are in their work, where they're um, showing and integrating the arts and music and all kinds of things. Nice, thank you Paquita. Uh -huh. yes. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're actually very excited about that part. Um, we feel that our, uh, the, so, you know, details, but the way the units were organized, um, we had uh, historians, teacher partners, um, and more teachers who are actually coming in now at this stage to ensure that exact piece. And so, um, if you're familiar, it's called reality pedagogy, right? And so, using the current day, right? So, our current country state community of affairs and so um, that is why this course is so exciting um, we do need to be reminded that it certainly will not be the panacea of recovery um, for racism in our country but it will absolutely going to make a change for the students who are participating in this course in how they look at it differently how they advocate for themselves differently and how they move forward in their lives so so thank you for those comments um, I have two questions. The first one is a very basic question because I'm new to this committee. At what point in the, like what age in, in the high school years can somebody take this course? Is it any point in the four years or by the time you're junior, senior, you're taking electives like this? Uh, what point is it envisioned that it'll be off, most often taken? And that's a great question. And I'm sorry, I couldn't see who was asking that. Um, part of the infrastructure supports that have um, been recommended is that this be an elective course in the junior and or senior year. Um, Stephen has been integral, Stephen Armstrong from the State Department in helping us understand what the majority of high schools are implementing across the state. So um, the majority of high schools offer their electives in the junior and senior year. That would also allow some content knowledge being built for the required courses such as U.S. history and world history, um, possibly civics depending on their sequence, learning sequence, um, to have some of that prerequisite knowledge also built. What that I say that on you know one side of my mouth, on the other side of my mouth, I'm, if there is a freshman who is eager about taking this and they could fit the elective in their freshman year, I believe, Stephen, that was something that the committee said, you're not gonna shy that freshman away, correct? Sure, this is Steve Armstrong, social studies consultant. There are schools that require students to be juniors and seniors to take electives. There's high schools that that's just a rule. There's other schools that are, are far more open. So just to back up Michelle, um, it really depends on the school district and their rules concerning electives. Okay. I might, yeah, I might suggest, Martha, that a student might be, might be. I mean, if a, if a kid is excited as a freshman, go for it if the rules allow it. But I think a kid might be more, get more out of this class if they'd already taken the regular US history class and had gotten that background. And then in this course, they should take, they could course, so they could really specialize on these topics. I think that might be a cool thing. Right. I follow, 
Oh, thank you. I follow what you said, Stephen, and also back to Michelle. Um, you kind of touched on what was going to be my second question: Is the tiebacks to their existing curriculum? Can our is the work from this development of curriculum going to help the world history teacher, the U.S. history teacher, to maybe you know build upon their existing curriculum and help tie it, and then maybe feed some kids into this program to say, "I'm sorry, we don't have enough time because, but you can you know take this in two years." Yeah, so so that's something um, Stephen and I talked about early, early on, right? And so that is our dream, our hope um, that actually some of these lessons will have a little symbol or asterisk next to them that a U.S. history teacher could use to teach the same, you know, lesson or parts, you know, there of that lesson. And so that it is something that we're starting to build and integrate as not a separate. <laughs> Right, but going back to this may become part of how we're teaching U.S. history in the future. So, yes, those integrations and yes, those recommendations to excite students who want to take this course um, will absolutely be part of the curriculum. Will, will you see that on the page? You know where all those integrations are. You know in this first um, iteration that you see. Um, maybe you won't see that until after that first year of implementation of where all those tiebacks are. But great question. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, so so this I think this is this is great. Um, and I'm gonna and Estella and I will especially thank you for teeing up the, the first question because that that is true. Like this is it's not our mandate to to um, dictate curriculum or right. cur curriculum or review. Um, so my frustration in this lies in the fact that what you are presenting today today is U.S. history, and the fact that it is not seen as U.S. history is, is very troublesome um, because the way it's presented, especially to young people, that there are three histories, right? That there's U.S. history, there's African-American or Black history, and there is Latino or Latina history, when in fact they are one history and it should be taught as such. But however, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. That is a frustration for me that I will put on the table. Um, secondly, um, it's, I think it's, it's Paquita. Uh, I would love for the word dispersal to be changed to dias diaspora. I think changing it to diaspora to me gives it real context into kind of African origin, if you will. Um, so Absolutely. that's just a recommendation. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Absolutely. All right. And I'm sorry. Go ahead, Stephen. Could I make a comment respectfully, sir? Um, sure. Yeah, I think that you would find if you looked at most, and, and you would, I'm, I'm guessing that most U.S., I would say all U.S. history courses um, have some part of African American and Black history in them, to be honest with you, at the high school level. Probably not, but I, I think the area where this course is really going to help out, I'm, I'm, I know this, that there's far less of the Latino Puerto Rican side. So, I mean, so I think that's going to be, I, I, there's a million reasons for that. But I wouldn't say that U.S. history classes are absent of this, but I, I think the reason for the elective is allow, allowing those students that are interested to get into it a little more. So I'm not disagreeing with your comments, but I'm just adding that little perspective. No, I, disagreeing is a good thing, um, and I appreciate that. I'm speaking and inspired by my own experiences as a student, where all we learned about was a little bit about Martin Luther King and a lot about slavery. And so, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, at some point these things could be merged. So, but I appreciate your perspective. Sure. And lastly, um, as I looked at the list of um, African American, the, that curriculum, and I think it alludes to what a Wilder was saying, I'm hoping implicit and the connective tissue to those units is this idea of beauty and dignity and, and overcoming because I, I heard a lot about um, struggle. And so, but but I did hear a little bit of art in there in which I was happy to hear, but, but I want to make sure that, you know, the black existence in this, in this country is not just um, about struggle and um and it's probably more about overcoming than it is about struggle 
So I, I, those are my my pieces. I just wanted to add. Hey, Eric, you hit the nail on the head. That's that at the when this was presented to the committee the first time, I mentioned the word identity, the importance of identidad. Okay, in both communities, because our our our, our folks, our young students, are losing their identity. Who am I? Where do I come from? How, what can I contribute based on who I am? My language, my culture, my values, my traits, my religion, it goes on and on and on. Okay, That it just doesn't become all about oppression and all about yeah. uh, that we understand the importance of so that when they leave at the end of the curriculum, at the end of that academic year, that they're leaving with a sense of pride of who they are. Because if I don't know who I am, I cannot give what I don't have. That's okay. right. And so therefore, right. I'm with you, Eric, I'm 100% with you. Yeah, we agree yet. absolutely that we highlight the strengths and accomplishments of the, all of our groups for all the students to see and understand. And I, I wanted to add, uh, perhaps it might be helpful next time. We just we have been talking about using concepts that what you're saying, right? So we we're very mindful of this voice and perspective because truly that's what our students asked us to do right how do you empower me and how do you help me understand who i am right so when we have an example of a lesson of using music and art we talk about the fact that puerto rico was the uh, has been the last protest was the most peaceful one non-violent one and that was highlighted as in many many places around the world so that students will get to see that, to hear that and understand, wow, or like, you know, 60,000 Latinos turn 18 every month and they can register to vote. How powerful is that, right? Like they don't get to hear these little bits and pieces. So we, as a team, talked about using words like of wisdom and self-determination uh, and perseverance for just to um, intersect for both uh, semesters. So we're trying to figure out how to put it like in the infographic format and so that it can help our students see the beauty of who we are so good morning everyone it's great to see you all um dr lopez as she mentioned she and i have worked together for many years on many different projects and i do have to say this is one that has hit me in ways that I have not yet been hit emotionally. Um, being involved in the work, going to the meetings, hearing the stories from people, hearing about um, their passion, I have to tell you that in meetings we are in tears, in tears. And then trying to capture that and put it into a curriculum has been just a very empowering and powerful experience. Please know the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus have been very much steering this work and staying very close to the work. They attend many of the meetings. In the very beginning, they too were divided. They wanted two separate curricula, one year each, and they came together through this legislation. And um, it is just, it is like Michelle alluded to also, it has been groundbreaking. They, we have never before had a state mandated curricula with a mandated course. Um, they do have to offer the course. They don't necessarily have to force students to take it. But what we're trying to do is to make it so that all kids want to take it. Uh, and Michelle said also, we have had hundreds of people chiming into this work. A lot of the uh, post-secondary um, instructors have really been guiding the work through a variety of materials. Um, we just so appreciate the time today. When we first, Steve and I first heard about this when it was just in the infancy, and then when it was passed as legislation, the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus did give money. So as Michelle said, we hired Cirque to do the work. And that's also how Gladys's position came to be. So that was just a little bit of history for you. Um, I continue to be in the work just because it is so um, powerful is the only word I can think of right now. Steve and I and Gladys working together with Cirque.
I do have to give Circa a shout out. They have handled, we've had some really difficult, difficult conversations and they have, they just, they have a way in which they affirm and also gently guide. So it, it's really been a learning experience for me in that way too. So thank you for giving this, me this moment to speak. It is in the legislation that you all as a board will be approving this curriculum and then writing a um, joint memo with CERC to the General Assembly about it. Then it's our responsibility at the state to monitor and make sure that people have offered the course and to watch to see how many students are taking the course. And we're hoping to be quite honest that the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus continue to send us funds to support the professional learning aspect, just as you all were touching on, not only for those teachers who are directly teaching the course, but others who are feeding to the course or working with them like the US history, et cetera. So thank you all, it's good to see you. Appreciate the time. Could I, I apologize, two very brief comments. Is that okay? Very brief. Um, first off, you know, worrying about the, and I am, we all were at the beginning of how this is gonna be taught. The last thing we'd ever, anybody would want would be this course would be taught by some, a teacher standing in front of the room lecturing the kids. Um, the good thing is this is based on the social studies frameworks, which includes inquiry instruction, which means kids engaged in the subject matter, kids working on projects, kids working on research. So that, that's a cool thing. And the other thing is talking to a lot of districts. Don't worry, there are districts more than you might know that are interested in, in jumping on board next year, not waiting till the 2022 year, but starting next year and doing it as a pilot year. So plenty of districts are gonna do that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Are there any more questions? Okay, we can move on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so we'll drop from the call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. No, are we at agenda uh, item number four on the agenda, Ajit? Yes. Okay. Uh, Eric, if I may, Ajit, if, if I may, given the data that you share about teachers of color, I just want to remind my fellow board members that when we first began really to expect um, that the status quo is not acceptable, I think 95% uh, white teachers. So the fact that we have 90% and 10% now, it's more diverse. It seems like a small, small fraction but I know it's very significant and I know it's a sign that things are beginning to be addressed and to uh, ensure the, that we recruit teachers of color. So I, it gives me a, it gives me hope, let me put it that way. You know, it's a small percentage, but it's a big uh, step ahead. So thank you. Uh, Estella, I, that's a great point because the way I interpreted that data was that white teachers left. You know what I mean? And no, so I, I, yeah. God, go ahead, I'm sorry. Scary. If you remember, we at the board were really very adamant that that trend had to be changed, that we needed to recruit more. And I think there's been an effort very intentional to recruit more teachers of color with a number of things not one thing but a number of things um and i think that that is what's happening that is what's showing raising awareness and ensuring that um the expectation is out there that's my hope ajit can he can add but i think that's what i'm seeing so i just wanted to point it out because in in the midst of um all kinds of bad things happening i want to see some good friends so. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> Yeah. All right, Z. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, 
I wanted to do a brief update here. I know we're running a little short on time, um, but I wanted to do a brief update on the data collections that we have stood up and are standing up to support student engagement uh, during the 2021 school year. And this really goes back to uh, the spring when the state as a whole uh, you know, went to emergency remote instruction. We, the whole state shut down and we had to, everybody had to shift to remote instruction. Uh, initially, the, the thinking was that it would be uh, for a short period of time, maybe for a few weeks, and then we would come back and things like that. But clearly, as we know, that was not the case. And we were remote for the whole spring semester. And we also know from our surveys, which I've shared with you and the state board in the past, that we had a sizable chunk of our student population, especially in our higher need uh, districts and communities, who did not engage with distance learning. Uh, some less than fully, and some not at all. They just disappeared. And uh, clearly that is not acceptable. Um, and uh, the department is absolutely committed to having a greater sense of how things are rolling out this year. Uh, when the state board, uh, the full board approved the resolution to allow for schools to operate in hybrid schedules or even potentially when health metrics point to fully remote schedules, that those days would count as school days towards the 177 day, you know, this year we've reduced to the three days. Uh, so the 177 days, so those would be school days. So we know that is there, but we were, uh, we were sort of saying, we can't operate like we did in spring. We need to have a much closer sense of what is going on. So I just wanna briefly mention to you that we've stood up two uh, collections, if you will. One is a weekly collection where we are asking districts to tell us by grade, what is their learning model? And by that, I mean, whether they're operating in a uh, fully in-person, hybrid, or remote, uh, to tell us what their enrollment is, because we don't know, we don't have the student level enrollment data just yet, that's actually coming through. So we wanted aggregates from the districts. Hey, just tell us how many kids you have. Not only that, also tell us, how many of those kids are fully remote? Because as you know, our reopen guidance allows parents to opt into fully remote. So we have asked districts to tell us how many of your kids are fully remote? And of those who are fully remote, how many are disconnected? And by disconnected, we mean basically that they're not, they didn't connect for the past week with any schooling activity. And this could mean that the school itself that, um, the, the, uh, the, you know, the kid never logged in to any uh, learning, uh, never made a connection with a teacher uh, or, or, or anything, or, you know, it's really that the kid who's, so to speak, fallen off the grid, that nobody has any sense for what happened that past week. So we're, we're collecting information on how many are fully remote, and of those fully remote, how many are disconnected. Because if they're not fully remote, they're either in person or they're coming on a hybrid schedule, where at least you know, and the hybrid models have varied uh, a little bit, but typically it's two days on, three days off. Uh, we've also heard of models where it's one week on, one week off, uh, where they're doing flip uh, one week to week for cohorts. You know, so districts are really trying their very best to try to do this. So we, we've stood up this weekly collection that will tell us week to week, what's the learning model, how many students, how many remote, and how many of the remote are disconnected gives us a quick pulse on a week to week basis as to what's going on. And we just finished our first week collection uh, on, on uh, Friday. Uh, and so that data actually is being prepped to get online uh, in the next day or two. So very shortly, that information will be available publicly where you'll be able to see for each district, what, you know, if they've started school, what is their model, um, and, and how many kids and how many remote and how many of the remote were disconnected. So that's part one. Part two is the more detailed collection where we are at the end of each month going to ask districts to give us at a student level the uh, days of membership and days of attendance for the month that just ended. So at the end of September, 
we're going to be getting September's attendance, if you will, for a kid level. So that normally this is information we collect at the end of the year. So these are all brand new. Uh, so we will actually be able to analyze that information, uh, do it by all our subgroups, you know, students with disabilities, English learners, look at a school level, look at a district level, all that, all those angles to, again, get a sense of how students actually are attending. Uh, so it's not just about you know disconnection, but now it's about attendance because the board's definition for attendance is that the student is there for at least half the day, half the school day. We've also issued guidance for what it means to be in attendance on a in a remote setting. So if a kid is remote, their work, their attendance in synchronous classes, et cetera, has to add up to half a day. And if it adds up to half a day, then the kid is considered in attendance. So we're basically pulling together this weekly collection, which has already begun, and then this uh, student level collection, which will start at the end of this month to, um, to get a much more immediate insight into how these varied models of public schooling that's out there now, how are they actually working to do the first most fundamental thing, which is to engage the students and keep them connected to schooling. So uh, some information will be getting up there this week, um, and then every week thereafter, as schools open, we'll know that uh, more and more information. And then we'll have uh, more detailed information in the middle of October, because by the time we collect September's attendance and do all the analysis, we'll need, we'll need, a, we'll need a little time there. But we'll know much more on a more immediate basis how things are, things are actually working out. I have to say that this is a lift for the districts. Um, and we've been uh, commissioner, uh, the deputies, myself and other senior leadership at SDE have been working with superintendents groups. I have to acknowledge that these are new things as they're starting to open up school, we're asking them to report data to us. Um, so there, there is a lot that's on them. Uh, we are we're supporting them in, in ways like we never have. We've conducted webinars last week uh, and we're also working with student information system vendors. We normally don't do this because different districts have different vendors, but we're working with those vendors to tell them, hey, this is our expectation. Help the districts out. Don't charge them anything for it. So we're, we're sort of making that point to the vendors as well. And they've been very supportive and cooperative up to this point. So we're hopeful that on the student level data, they'll be able to help the districts pull the information as possible. So weekly attendance to, to get a dipstick, and then the monthly student level data to get much more in-depth information is in the works, again, to, to support your commitment that if districts are operating in all these different models, that we need to know more clearly what's going on. So that's my that's my spiel, but I'll, I'll take questions. Eric, can you ask? Please. Um, I did, thank you so much for doing that. And you know, I know it's gonna be, very complicated because for example you have Meriden who announced one of the middle schools announced is going to be now going remotely for two weeks so you're going to be capturing all that I think it's absolutely fantastic because we can see whether when they switch or not yet they lose students but you're going to be capturing all that that that's that's incredible thank you so much yeah we're we're actually asking districts to report to us after the week is completed because what we were doing before was asking them to tell us what their model would be for a week and what they thought would be for a week and what actually happened were often two different things. So we switched to saying immediately after the week ends, tell us what you did, tell us how many students, that type of thing. When it comes to the student level data collection, another nuance there is we're actually asking districts to split up their membership and attendance days separately for in-person days and remote days, meaning that Think about a hybrid kid who's coming two days on and three days off in a week, right? So in a month, the, the kid might be coming in person for 10, eight days and remote for 10 days. So we're asking for the, the district to give us how the kid attended on the in-person days, the eight days, and how the kid attended on the remote days. So it's, it's again, it's, it's, it's pretty granular information that we're asking for. And it is a big lift for the districts, like I said, and we're working with the student information system vendors, but we should be able to make, you know, uh, we will be able to learn things like, do kids um, who are in in-person schools who are fully remote, do they have better attendance on the remote days than 
uh, kids in hybrid schools, you know, who are attending on a hybrid format on the remote day. So we'll be able to do much more nuanced analysis as the monthly collection builds up. But yes, that's what we're working towards. Um, as you, so oh, sorry to cut you off, Eric. Um, thank you for acknowledging your work um, about the big lift for the districts because that was that's what I was thinking about. That's a lot of data, and they're already over their heads in everything else right now. It's so important. Um, it's glad that we can track it, but I can see that that's a, a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of time they don't have right now. No, totally, totally hear you and totally hear the districts. Uh, we have heard from several of them uh, because they don't have opinions with us, rightly so. We want them to do that and they have uh, aired their concerns and we continue to address it. You know, I think there will be there will be things that we will see in the coming weeks that we need to tweak. So we're we're continuing to work with them on the monthly collection. I think the first month's data will be uh, sort of a work in progress. I think the split between remote and in person will probably not be good for the first month because people have already started and so on. Uh, but at least we'll know how kids are attending as a whole, and then starting with October attendance will be in better shape. Question, G. Um, in terms of your work with the superintendents or the districts, um, has that been incredibly cumbersome? Or because I know a lot is going on here in New Haven in terms of just really coordinating and 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 getting buy-in with ver district versus board of ed and all those things. I wonder. I was wondering how that's going. I, I think the districts have been fantastic. Um, I think the the data people in the districts have been fantastic. Um, I think they 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 know it's a big lift. Uh, they want us to know that it's a big lift for them, and we hear them fully. Uh, and uh, but I feel also heard by them that at a state level, when the state board is offering different learning models and allowing for hybrid and remote models to be in place, that uh, as the state board and as the governor and, this, and the legislators, we need to be able to say that when we provide public school in all these different ways that students are engaged and attending. And, and of course, we'll get to the learning, but first it's really just about, are they there? Are they coming? Are they doing their work? Are they just on a week to week basis? So I think, I think it's a team effort. I, I think the districts have been extremely cooperative uh, considering the demands. Uh, so I, I think they've been they've been super cooperative. I have nothing but the highest regard and respect for our superintendents. That that's fantastic, man. That's good good positive report. I appreciate that. It's good to hear. Any other questions? No. Okay. One Martha? quick question. So the October the September data should come out before the September full board meeting, or no? It's too it's going to be too close. The uh, the week to week data, yes, which is really just learning model and number of students and just remote and disconnected, that's going to come out this week. Okay. Um, and that will be updated every week. There will be a map, is what we're looking at right now, that will show you. You could just hover over the map and look at how much, you know, percent remote. You could look at the district. We're also including, I failed to mention this, we're also including approved private special eds. Uh, in this weekly collection because we want uh, our our students with some of our most severe needs to be uh, who might be outplaced to these centers to also be reporting so they're also reporting so the week to week you'll have soon and and ongoing the September attendance student level data you will probably be able to release that sometime in mid October that's okay. what we're because that's going to be more detailed yep. great any other questions Okay. Thanks, Abhi. We move on to number five. Sure, thank you. I can name this tune in three minutes, <laughs> watching the clock. <laughs> but what I will do is just share my screen so I can just show you the website and I'll talk through the CT Learning Hub. So I'll do that now. And this way you have the visual. So I just wanted to make sure that we were able to provide you with an update on the CT Learning Hub because I know that you've been hearing a lot about it. And what I'd like to do is show you how to get there 
but also to provide you with three things. So what we did do on the website is we created this button here, CT Learning Hub, so um, users can just click in or they could search it. And this is our graphic. And what we were trying to do here is solve a problem. Um, one of the problems was um, trying to find the information. So the hub, using that term, is that here's the hub of accelerating learning and advancing equity, and kind of these spokes that go out to additional learning hubs to support the users when they visit the, the state website. Also, the other problem we were trying to solve, which you were part of, is how, to, how do we ensure that students have access to high quality, high impact learning and resources, and regardless of the user, whether you're a teacher, a student, or a parent, grandparent, community member, that you could go to the, the state website or the state as an agency with confidence to find what you were looking for. So that was another purpose of our CT Learning Hub. We wanted to provide that access to content. So um, there are eight spokes. If you have not explored yet, I encourage you to do so. The big one right now is Online Learning Hub, where we have been partnering with a number of providers um, in kind across the state, and like such as Wide Open School, Connecticut Public to have access to broadcast content so they can view it through their television, and other resources within the, within the state agencies, such as like Doug Casey and his team, as well as our Rusk Alliance, our universities, and other academic partners. So we're, we're growing, we're constantly growing every single day and adding additional resources to the CT Learning Hub. The other thing that we, I wanted to point out is that wherever you go in any of the spokes and the additional hubs, they all look the same. It was important that users were not code switching, if you will, so that if they went into the online content or went to the parent learning hub, we were always starting with our why. Why are you here? Who should use it? When should you use it? And then we use this accordion type of drop or fold so that they could find their resources. The last thing I wanted to point out on the learning hub, and we have it for both parents as well as educators, is something that we're, you're, we're creating together with, um, within the agency is on-demand playlists. So we have this structure of a PD playlist and we're curating additional resources based on a topic. And so this will be also very familiar regardless of the topic that you are clicking into. And what we're trying to do is that just read one, watch one, or listen to one. And that should build your understanding of that particular topic or question that you're trying to find an answer to. And the last thing on this, on the PD playlist are reflection questions. So take time, think about it. What, what's the new awareness, new um, ways that you're going to go back and solve the problem? And we've been doing that um, for educators, for parents, and even for students. We had a return to learning playlist. What I wanted to do, um, I'll stop sharing so I can speak to you, is I wanted to acknowledge a lot of our partners Internally, uh, Matt Falconer has been tremendous in helping me build the website and add content. He is my lead where I can send him the resources and he gets them up there right away. Andrea Wadowski, she was critical in creating the graphics. So I really appreciate her help and attention to detail. Aji is always a, a partner as far as project planning and thinking through. I can talk with him to say, what do you think? Is this the right direction? as well as everyone else in the agency at the academic side, as well as the turnaround side, because we are all working with districts. So we wanna make sure that we're putting the right resources, right conditions in the hands of our districts and teachers. Um, I also want to highlight and acknowledge to Commissioner Cardona and Deputy Commissioner Nesmith um, for their leadership, as well as the vision to then say, Irene, this is what we're thinking, and what can we do? How do we get there? And they let me do it and work with the team, and we bring it back, and we say, yep, that worked. Let's get it out there and get that into the hands of everyone. Real quick, the future of the CT Learning Hub, we will continue to add to the resources. We currently have a request for proposals out. It is due to return September 28th, where we'll go through the process of reviewing the proposals we're casting a wide net because we not only want content, but we also want tools that can support collaboration, can support e-portfolios, that can provide analytics and a formative assessments. So we're, we're asking for a lot. We're, we're very hopeful, and I know hope isn't a strategy, but we hope that these vendors will see the potential in partnering with us. So that's due to come back, as well as um, the K-12 model curriculum. 
that will be delivered through here. And like um, you heard in the previous presentation with Doug Casey partnering with him on kind of like a curriculum database that is searchable and that it can be housed there and aligned to our national standards or state standards, as well as what we believe should be in the design of curriculum. So um, thank you. I hope I did that in four minutes and I, can, I welcome any questions or comments. <laughs> Any questions? Martha? Yes. Um, do you have any, I mean, it gives the clicks. Well, how, what's your usage? Are people using it? Teachers, parents, do you have any feedback from that um, yes. perspective? Excellent question. Yes, I'm always excited to hear how many clicks in a week. I know when we launched, we had 7,000 in a day. So I thought that was tremendous. I do not have an analytics report at this time, but we are on it. But that is something I can follow up with. and in addition to some of the slides that I had prepared. Cool, thank you. I did hear from Laura Stefan. It's one of the hottest things we've got going right now. Ah, good. <laughs> it, is, it is. I love it. That's great. No, I'm, I'm, it looks awesome. I want to make sure that people are using it and know that it's out there. Yes, yeah, so we've been doing an engagement series and working with CAPS and doing a number of um, kind of technical assistance or how to use it because we're trying to make sure that everyone understands it's meant to supplement the resources you do have in districts and build upon your assets. So again, there's more to come. So where it might also be the thing that you would use too. So we're trying to balance that, but we are working with all of the districts on it. Any other questions? All right, Irene, thank you. Um, you are right, hope is, hope is not a strategy, but there is no strategy without hope, right? And so, that is true. So I, I, I thank you for that. Um, it is now 11.01. And um, I mean, you know, I appreciate this time. This is a great, great discussion. Thank you to everyone who, who really added to a really powerful discussion. Um, you know, in my estimation, this is the finest committee. Uh, that SDE has. <laughs> um, but again, I, I just uh, very thankful for you all in your time. Um, with that, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Thank you. Second. We are adjourned. I, I pray you all have a very powerful week. Thank you. Thank you. Malia, I want to hear from you the next time, Malia. Malia, <laughs> I had too many feelings earlier, but you expressed them all very adequately, Eric. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was waiting for one of your cutting questions. So I. <laughs> God, have a great week. Thanks, Ajit. Thank you. The next meeting is November 16th. I'll send a reminder and notice about that. Thank you.